The death of the Witch of Berkeley in 1065 AD. Here is an historical account that's recorded by medieval chronicler William of Malmesbury, who wrote this in the 1120s, the early days of England. It's about a woman living at Berkeley, formerly Gloucestershire, who was rumored to be skilled in witchcraft. In the castle later constructed at Berkeley in Gloucestershire, the dreadful murder of Edward II took place in 1327. This is where the tale begins. There resided at Berkeley a woman addicted to witchcraft, as it afterwards appeared, and skilled in ancient augury, and of bad character. On a certain day, as she was regaling, a jackdaw, which was a very great favorite, chattered a little more loudly than usual. On hearing which the woman's knife fell from her hand, her countenance grew pale and deeply groaning. This day, said she, my plow has completed its last furrow. Today I shall hear of and suffer some dreadful calamity. While yet speaking, the messenger of her misfortunes arrived, and being asked why he approached with so distressed an air, I bring news, said he, from that village, naming the place of the death of your son and of the whole family by a sudden accident. At this intelligence, the woman, sorely afflicted, immediately took to her bed, and perceiving death rapidly approaching, she summoned her surviving children, a monk and a nun, by urgent letters, and when they arrived with a faltering voice, addressed them thus. Formerly, my children, I constantly administered to my wretched circumstances by demoniacal arts. I have been the sink of every vice, the teacher of every allurement, yet while practicing these crimes, I was accustomed to soothe my hapless soul with the hope of your piety. Despairing of myself, I rested my expectations on you. I advanced you as my defenders against evil spirits, my safeguards against my strongest foes. Now, since I have approached the end of my life and shall have those eager to punish who lured me to sin, I entreat you by your mother's breasts, if you have any regard, any affection, at least to endeavor to alleviate my torments. And although you cannot revoke the sentence already passed upon my soul, yet you may perhaps rescue my body by these means. Sew up my corpse in the skin of a stag, lay it on its back in a stone coffin, fasten down the lid with lead and iron. On this lay a stone, bound round with three iron chains of enormous weight. Let there be psalms sung for fifty nights, and masses said for an equal number of days, to allay the ferocious attacks of my adversaries. If I lie thus secure for three nights, on the fourth day bury your mother in the ground, although I fear lest the earth, which has been so often burdened with my crimes, should refuse to receive and cherish me in her bosom. They did their utmost to comply with her injunctions, but alas I vain were pious tears, vows or entreaties, so great was the woman's guilt, so great the devil's violence. For on the first two nights after her death, while the choir of priests was singing psalms around the body, the devils one by one with the utmost ease, bursting open the door of the church, though dosed with an immense bolt, broke asunder the two outer chains. The middle one being more laboriously wrought, remained entire. On the third night about cockcrow, the whole monastery seemed to be overthrown from its very foundation by the clamor of the approaching enemy. One devil, more terrible in appearance than the rest, and of loftier stature, broke the gates to shivers by the violence of his attack. The priests grew motionless with fear. Their bar stood on end, and they became speechless. He proceeded, as it appeared, with haughty steps towards the coffin, and calling on the woman by name, commanded her to rise. She, replying that she could not on account of the chains, you shall be loosed, said he, and to your cost. And directly he broke the chain, which had mocked the ferocity of the others, with as little exertion as though it had been made of flax. He also beat down the cover of the coffin with his foot, and taking her by the hand, before them all, he dragged her out of the church. 
At the doors appeared a black horse, proudly neighing with iron hooks projecting over his whole back, on which the wretched creature was placed, and immediately, with the whole party, vanished from the eyes of the beholders. Her pitiable cries, however, for assistance, were heard for nearly the space of four miles. No person will deem this incredible, who has read St. Gregory's dialogues. In the last part of the 5th century, barbarian invasions brought about the downfall of the Roman Empire, plunging Europe into what became known as the Dark Ages. In response, influenced by the Italian monk Saint Benedict, monasteries began to become popular across Europe. These monasteries served as havens of learning, while the world outside descended into chaos. They safeguarded the intellectual heritage of Rome and the Bible, all the while fostering scholarship and the preservation of moral values. Life within these monasteries was difficult. Saint Benedict established the Benedictine rule, embodying the core principles of monastic life, ora et labora, or prayer and work. Monks adhered to a strict schedule of prayer, labor and study. Much of their time was devoted to copying the Bible and ancient texts from the Roman Empire, ensuring that this wealth of knowledge would endure for future generations. Pope Gregory I, commonly known as the Great, led the Church from 590 to 602 AD. Before becoming Pope, he served as the Abbot of St. Andrews, a monastery near Rome. His writings offer valuable insights into the daily life of monks and the moral principles guiding monastic communities. One of the rules set forth by St. Benedict specified that the monastery was to be a commune in which all possessions were held in common and personal property forbidden. Gregory recalls an incident in which a monk was found to have three gold pieces and describes the consequences of this transgression. There was in my monastery a certain monk Eustace by name, skilled in medicinal arts. When he knew that his end was at hand, he made known to Copiosus, his brother in the flesh, how that he had three gold pieces hidden away. Copiosus, of course, could not conceal this from the brethren. He sought carefully and examined all his brother's drugs until he found the three gold pieces hidden away among the medicines. When he told me this great calamity that concerned a brother who had lived in common with us, I could hardly hear it with calmness. For the rule of our monastery was always that the brothers should live in common and own nothing individually. Then, stricken with great grief, I began to think what I could do to cleanse the dying man, and how I should make his sins a warning to the living brethren. Accordingly, having summoned Pretiosus, the superintendent of the monastery, I commanded him to see that none of the brothers visited the dying man, who was not to hear any words of consolation. If in the hour of death he asked for the brethren, then his own brother in the flesh was to tell him how he was hated by the brethren because he had concealed money, so that at death remorse for his guilt might pierce his heart and cleanse him from the sin he had committed. When he was dead, his body was not placed with the bodies of the brethren, but a grave was dug in the dung pit, and his body was flung down into it, and the three pieces of gold he had left were cast upon him, while all together cried, Thy money perish with thee. When thirty days had passed after his death, my heart began to have compassion on my dead brother, and to ponder prayers with deep grief, and to seek what remedy there might be for him. Then I called before me Pretiosus, superintendent of the monastery, and said sadly, It is a long time that our brother who died has been tormented by fire, and we ought to have charity toward him, and aid him so far as we can, that he may be delivered. Go therefore, and for thirty successive days from this day, offer sacrifices for him. See to it that no day is allowed to pass on which the salvation-bringing mass is not offered up for his absolution. He departed forthwith and obeyed my words. We, however, were busy with other things, and did not count the days as they rolled by. But Io, the brother who had died, appeared by night to a certain brother, even to Copiosus, his brother in the flesh. 
When Copiosa saw him, he asked him, saying, What is it, brother? How art thou? To which he answered, Up to this time I have been in torment, but now all is well with me, because today I have received the communion. This Copiosus straightway reported to the brethren in the monastery. Then the brethren carefully reckoned the days, and it was the very day on which the thirtieth oblation was made for him. Copiosus did not know what the brethren were doing for his dead brother, and the brethren did not know that Copiosus had seen him. Yet at one and the same time he learned what they had done, and they learned what he had seen, and the vision and the sacrifice harmonized. So the fact was plainly shown forth how that the brother who had died had escaped punishment through the salvation-giving Mass.